Hello, you're listening to The Secrets of Sacred Art, where we unearth the hidden treasury, history, and deeper meanings in religious and sacred art. We're your hosts, Catherine Laffrey. And I'm Alex Murray. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 4, The One About Pugin. Well, it's actually Episode 11. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's okay. Season, that's right. Who's but who's counting? <laughs> Obviously not me. <laughs> It'll all work. Okay. Oh it will. It will. It'll all work out in the, in the wash, as they say. So, so welcome everyone to episode eleven, and we're going to be talking about one of our favorite people ever. And um, if you don't know him. I guarantee you by the time we're finished with this podcast, you are going to want to really know him. And uh, so uh, the person we're talking about is August Welby Northmore Pugin. And we're going to go into his history for our viewers, of course. But let's briefly, Catherine, let's discuss how you and I first met Mr. Pugin. And what is it about him that we find so appealing? So I'll let you, I'll give it, hand it over to you. It's funny because it's like, I've always been familiar when I hear the name Pugin. And I know it means something really nice. But then (laughs) as taking uh, architecture class and taking um, a couple of the other classes for our master's program. And then also uh, David Clayton wrote some really nice articles. And I think he also did a a podcast about Pugin also. That's when I really started like, okay, I got to deep dive into this guy, not just know him at a surface level. And then, of course, researching for this, it's like, oh, he's my guy now. He <laughs> I know, totally is. I know so much more about him now than ever. And it's just, oh, yeah, he's awesome. He is. He is. And I think I've been, well, I mean, for many years, gosh, I'm thinking probably even before my husband and I met, I was, you know, I always loved the pre-Raphaelites, you know, I was so into that. And I think it's because I love fantasy. And if you look at a lot of the pre-Raphaelite um, art work, it's, it's very much like in that fantasy world, even if it is, it's just the way they, they the colors that are so saturated and they're all very romantic. Okay, and you gotta give me a timeline on the pre-Raphaelites. So they're a little bit. I never af- keep it straight. <laughs> okay, so the pre-Raphaelites were actually influenced by Pugin. Okay, and as was the arts and craft movement in the yes. the United Kingdom or the British arts and craft movement, and that's with um, William Morris and um, Gabriel Dante. Uh, that that um, sorry, Dante. I can't remember his last name. His sister was a poet. Uh, Can't help you. I know. Oh, it'll come to me, you know, again. Oh, I hate it when I, when I lose these names. But anyway, Rossetti. Thank you. Dante Rossetti. And then his sister was, um, I think, Elizabeth Rossetti. No. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's but, okay. Back to Pugin. Yes, back to Pugin. <laughs> but anyway, so he actually influenced all these people because he, he was the he was the one who started the um, Gothic revival in, in Britain. And so his, his, um, his churches, his buildings, his designs are just achingly beautiful. And it was what I didn't appreciate until I started reading a book about him. And we'll have a link in the show notes to the book by Rosemary Hill called uh, God's Architect. Um, I had not appreciated how energetic he was. He just, he, not only did he influence um, entire movements in the 19th and 20th century, he made everything, he designed everything from like the nails in a doorknob to wallpaper (laughs) to cathedrals and railway Station, railroad stations. I mean, he just did everything. And he, he lived, he, he didn't live very long. Um, he died young. He was 40 when he died. And just for this, this man, to, he was like this, this amazing Roman candle, you know, glowing. And oh, yeah, and then he good was description. Gone. Yeah. And then he was gone. And, and he was kind of lost for a long time. 
and that's you know, why he we, got kind of pushed under the rug a little bit. <laughs> he did, and he's that's why he's on the secrets of sacred art because we want people to know about him. I mean, he is very well known, um, and I can guarantee you, everybody watching this or listening to this has seen at least two of his designs. Um, one being Big Ben, also known known. I think the clock is now called um, Elizabeth II. They renamed it. For her oh. jubilee, for the Queen's jubilee, yeah, and I mean, but people still call it Big Ben. Yeah, because that's the name of the bell. <clears throat> yes, yes. <laughs> and so um, he designed uh, the tower that Big Ben is in. He desired. He designed the clock face, and he designed Parliament. So everyone has seen his work, but it's like nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows who did it. You know, like it just you know these things didn't just grow up out of the ground. Although the way mm -hmm. he did, the way he designed it, it makes it look like it's been there forever. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So I'll just do a little bit of a brief bio on um, Pugin. And um, and I want to I really want to recommend Rosemary Hill's book. I really liked that. Uh, it's, it's well written. It's very detailed. Um, it goes into, well, every aspect of his life. And she clearly... Uh, loves him just as much as we do. <laughs> so, um, so Pugin was the son of um, a man called August Pugin. Yes, here here is um, Augustus Welby, uh, Northmore Pugin. But his father was called August Pugin, and he immigrated from um, France in uh, in an, an attempt to escape the French Revolution and. So this, the family story was that um, his father actually was some kind of minor aristocracy. And um, once he kind of saw what was happening to all the aristocracy in France, he, he decided to get out as quickly as possible, which, you know, that did happen. And he, he moved to England, which, where he met his wife, Catherine Welby. And she was from a very respectable like middle class, or I would say landed gentry family from Lincolnshire. Her brother owned a very large and successful farm. Um, August and Catherine had a home in London. And what's interesting is in the book by Rosemary Hill, she talks about how Catherine Welby really was, felt herself to be an egalitarian, you know, um, I guess politically and and socially, and and she felt like that was very much in um, consistent with her Christian faith. And uh, but um, she was a little uncomfortable with her husband's ease with the various classes, shall we say? So uh, she, okay. <laughs> so it, it's kind of funny. So he came from uh, supposedly came from this French aristocratic background you know, landed um, impoverished in, in London. And he was happy to kind of mingle and, and, and just, you know, hang out with whomever. And, uh, and she kind of kind of preached that, oh, this would be a real, this is a good thing. But when he actually implemented what she was preaching, she was kind of uncomfortable about it. So I thought that was very funny. Um, he was, so they only had one child and that was August. Pugin, and he was born when his mother was 40 years old, and he was uh, really a miracle baby for them. They absolutely doted on him. He did not go to school. He was homeschooled. His father actually had um, a drawing school for boys in the house, and he would, and this was the thing, like his wife was kind of a, uncomfortable with the fact that he would just except anybody into the school. Like if you could draw, yeah, come on in. And she's like, oh my gosh. So she, he would have Draper's sons. He would have, um, uh, you know, working class people whose, whose sons maybe had an ability to draw. He would have maybe some landed gentry. And so it was, so she kind of um, required that the boys, when they were coming to the school, they had to go through the back door. She didn't want them coming through the front door. <laughs> Uh -huh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Pugin, August Pugin, uh, I should say A-W-N Pugin, so the person that we're going to be focusing on, 
He grew up drawing, traveling around with his father. His father just seemed to be, I think, every young boy's dream teacher. Um, they, he always had them out in the parks and, and they would go on field trips. His version of field trips, you know, they'd go over to France and his father was really an expert at um, drawing Gothic buildings and structures. And he always wanted to know how they worked, not just, or, you know, how they functioned, not just how they looked on the outside, but he wanted to know what was going on on the inside. And in one case, he actually had someone cut a hole into the, in the roof of one of an old um, church tower. And he lowered boys into the inside of the tower and just told them to draw what they saw. <laughs> And some of them, there's a story, like some of them had a hard time getting out of the tower. <laughs> and um, yeah, so he was just, he was like this really, gre- he just seemed to be this really gregarious, adventurous, creative man with lots of energy. And and that's how his son grew up. His mother was, I would say, I'm, I kind of feel like I've kind of made her look bad, she, But she wasn't. She was she absolutely loved her husband and she loved her son. Um, She doted on both of them um, at one point. And we'll come to this in in uh, Pugin's uh, history. But he was really into the theater and she let him um, take part of the roof off of their attic and like build an entire theater for himself because that's what he wanted to do. (laughs) So she was just whatever he wanted. You know, and but in a good way, you know, I mean, she yeah. had standards and, and she was dis- she did believe in disciplining him. But um, but she was very uh, she wasn't afraid of his creativity. I think that's the <laughs> best way to put it, which is a really great lesson, I think, for oh, any yeah. parent. But um, I know you uh, sent me a wonderful video about. Uh, um a W. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it was neat to see the part where they talked about his mother making sure that he went to church with her. Yes. And yeah. oh my goodness, it was not a normal experience for a very energetic little boy. <laughs> no, no, because I guess we should say so his father was Catholic. Being French, he was Catholic. And um, his mother was uh, a member of the Church of England, as was everyone else. Um but she's, she found herself drawn to the Presbyterian Evangelical Church and a particularly um, charismatic Scottish preacher. But he was quite, um, in, in the Presbyterian Church, they really wanted to remove any imagery because they wanted the focus to be on the Word of God and the preacher. And so this and, and these sermons would last for hours and um, Pugin just had no tolerance for that. He just... Well, I mean, after running through the attic of some beautiful Gothic building somewhere... I know, I know. Sit just, still and sit listen st- to a preacher go on and on and on in a blank it, room. <laughs> exactly. You know, and it was really, it's really interesting. Um, not that we want to get too much into it, this, but this this podcast, you know, we're just going to be talking about you know, I kind of wish uh, we had Pugin here with us and we're going to pretend like he, he is here with us a little bit because um, I think it's interesting with when you think about all of the senses that human beings have. And this was something that he was really tuned into. And of course, vision, you know, what we see, what we smell, what we hear, all of those things are are there for a reason. And so to have this place of worship and have that completely removed, it would have been a really, it would have been, it would have been a struggle and, and, um, and how to make sense of that, you know, because you do get distracted. I mean, yeah. maybe I'm thinking of myself, but, you know, so, so I think Pugin's, um, sense of what he wanted to design, what he wanted to create in terms of how it related to the worship of God was influenced by his experience of going to this evangelical church with, um, with his mother. And, and sometimes you learn, I mean, you learn what not to do. You learn what doesn't work. And so for him, 
the way that was set up absolutely did not work. And, and like I said, he was, um, <clears throat> he was himself and he was incredibly gifted. Uh, so he's been At a very young age. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So he, um, and I think we're going to provide a link to the, the documentary that, that we watched yes. that I had sent to you about Pugin and they show in the, in the documentary, a, uh, a drawing that he did called my first church. And it was when he was nine years old and, um, it was pretty darn impressive, but then he's oh, yes. just been, he'd been drawing his whole life and had been surrounded by, by, um, artists and, and people who would draw and of course the enthusiasm of his own father. Mm-hmm. And when he was 15 years old, he was <laughs> commissioned yeah. to design the furniture for Windsor Castle. Um, the king at the time, I think it was King George the Third. Yes, because this was in Georgian times. He was having Windsor Castle completely redone. And and Pugin, 15-year-old Pugin, got the commission to design the furniture, which is, in this, this table that we're looking at, this is something that he designed at 15. At 15, yeah. Yeah, just, and you just, yeah, you look at that and you think. All the details. Yes, he was a big, he was big on detail. He really was. Um, he felt like every little bit counted. And, and that's how he designed. So this should give everyone an idea of, of where we're going with this, with this man. Um, it's important is, to remember, too. He designed it. He didn't build it. No. many <laughs> other craftsmen who had the skills to take his drawings and make them reality. Yes. Yes, exactly. And this is the thing about Pugin. Interestingly, he was never um, a properly trained architect. You know, he just drew what he wanted, but he surrounded himself with people who could kind of look at his his drawings and go, okay, that's not going to work, but this will work and we can get the same result. And the reason he was surrounded by these people is because um, he was very charming. You know, he was a really lovely young man. He, um, he cared about people. He cared about... Um, you know, he just had this reputation of being, yeah, like I said, being very energetic, being a little strange, but that's okay, mm-hmm. you know. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a little, but I think that added to his charm. And so moving on, like when he was 18 years old, he decided he wanted to go and work for the theater. Now to work in a Georgian theater was not, a good thing. And both of his parents were really not happy about it, but he found it to be very exciting and he loved all the costumes and he loved, um, uh, just, you know, the excitement of it. And, Mm -hmm. um, he started working out. I wanted to, I want to say he was something called a fly boy. I could be totally wrong about that, but you know, like up in the rafters where they're moving the curtains and the scenery. So he started out doing that. But then he very quickly, people discovered that he had a, um, a talent for painting and drawing, and he started designing the sets. And, um, and of course, they're all very, they're to the period of, say, when the play was written. So, for example, this was the first time uh, that uh, Shakespeare, a Shakespearean play was presented, and the people who were in the play were dressed in period costumes, and the scenery was supposed to be... Tudor scenery as opposed to contemporary. And so he, he did all of that. Um, and he started looking at things, um, in, you know, different perspectives and in three dimensional and that sort of thing. And he did meet his first wife, uh, in the theater. Um, and sadly she died, uh, shortly after giving birth to their first child. And I think he was probably 19 or 20 when, a very when, young single father. <laughs> yes, very young single father. And then his parents sadly died not long after that. I think he was like at 21, 22, and he was, he was all alone in the world, you know. And shortly after that, he did, um, <clears throat> he did convert to Catholicism. And there have been all kinds of theories as to why. Um, and mm-hmm. that's something that I think is worth discussing. Um, one of his friends said he, he, 
he converted to Catholicism out of boredom because of, <laughs> you know, the experience he'd had with his mother. He just wanted to do something that had all the smells and bells and colors and, and, and something that was more theatrical. And I don't think that's why he converted. You know, you, don't, you can't ever know a person's heart. I, I also read that yeah. um, he converted because of the architecture. And maybe we can, and, you know, we can debate whether or not that's a bad thing or not. Right. Um, it has happened. Yeah, that's the, one of the points of having, <laughs> that's one of the points of beauty in the church is, <laughs> is, is to con- convert the heart, is to, to capture it on one level. And, and if it did for him, that's great. That's a legitimate way of, of, of finding the truth. And that is something that, now when he converted to Catholicism, the um, the laws, the anti-Catholic laws were just starting to relax in Britain. So at this point, being Catholic was a, had been illegal for what, 400 years. Mm-hmm. And, um, but if you did convert to Catholicism, there was a, um, an assumption that you weren't uh, a loyal British subject. Mm-hmm. And so you were met with a lot of suspicion. And, um, and I think the fact that he had a French father probably didn't help, but, or help with people kind of being a little more charitable about his conversion. Mm-hmm. So, um, but he, uh, he did convert and, and that was just his life. It was like something just opened up in his life and his um, creativity exploded and he just started, he felt like Britain would be converted through beauty, essentially reconverted that, that the British people would come back to the Catholic faith through beauty. And I think that's why he was so energetic about it. And that, I think that's why he just did everything he did. You know, Mm -hmm. he just never stopped working. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about, um, just what you said about, um, the difficulty of being Catholic at that time period, um, was out not too long ago. There's three seasons of it, Victoria done by Masterpiece Theater, uh, shown on PBS in the U S very good job of giving you a feel for the time. Uh, they actually had a uh, a dresser of the queen who was Catholic, and she had a very nosy uh, co-worker who was always trying to find her beads, <laughs> her rosary, yeah. in her pocket so she could, like, prove her out, try to get her out of the castle. But she was very good at her job, especially doing the queen's hair. And so it was like... Okay, it's understandable. You're Catholic, that's fine. But there were a couple other episodes where they talked about kind of that unusual balance of being Catholic at that time period. So if you have the chance, check it out. I think it can be watched on either Prime or I think it's on Prime. Amazon Prime. Yeah, Yeah. I'm pretty sure. So very good show as far as just kind of giving you a feel. I mean, the writers made it a point to um, kind of talk about what things were historical and what things are their little ad libs, but they did a really nice job of trying to trying to give you a feel for what it would have been like to be there. Yeah, yeah, I think it's something that I hadn't I hadn't appreciated uh, what that experience must have been like until I moved to Britain, and then even hearing some of the you know stories from people who you know were young during World War II or whatever, there was still quite um, an anti-Catholic bias that, that ran through the country. Um, I think there was, it was even more complicated when you had a lot of Irish immigrants coming in in the 50s and 60s. And, and so it's something that's always been there. And, and I think for, for someone of Pugin's uh, status, 
because he wasn't like super wealthy and he wasn't a respected clergyman like like St. John Henry Newman or, you know, I think there was um, a Lord so-and-so. Yeah, you know, if somebody converted, you know, they might have been in a, play, a position of power and where it was, you know, there would have been some repercussions, but certainly not to the degree that you would have these repercussions from, you know, for someone like Pugin. But it, it just is very, can it's, very consistent with his personality he just he 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 wanted to follow truth and and that is something that he um that he says that he really insisted on was he he did see that connection between beauty and truth Mm -hmm. and i think he saw that his whole life and i think he saw that in all of the endless sketches that he did of Gothic cathedrals and Gothic buildings and that whole um, Christian original design, he didn't mm-hmm. like, um, he didn't like classical designs or neoclassic yeah. designs, which is what Georgian design is. And, and, um, and I, you know what? I, I understand where he's coming from. <laughs> I really do. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, but he had know, a lot of other sketches too, which, um, thankfully from being familiar with the show, I did a little searching yeah. about the relationship between Queen Victoria and Pugin and how he would have fit in. Cause I always want to know what else was going on at the time. Yeah, how did he fit yeah. in? And she was quite a big fan of his work. Yeah. And it was it was really neat just to kind of see that. And then I happened across the Victoria Albert Museum and their website has hundreds of Pugin sketches. Yeah. Wow. And oh, they're so fabulous. But um, you know, you had mentioned Pugin being a bit energetic and out there. <laughs> yeah. And I think what would you say there's something about him uh I saw it in your notes. That he uh, liked being a sailor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he was a little bit eccentric. Like so, he like that was his thing. He wanted to. He had he bought a boat. I can't remember how old he was when he decided he was going to buy this boat. There, it was. I found a sketch. That's a excellent. Boat. I bet that. Do you know what? <laughs> there looks like there's some rocks around it because what happened was he actually <laughs> the boat sank off the coast of Scotland, which is no, <laughs> you know, that's not a little deal. And yeah. um, and he was rescued. <laughs> and I just love that it's one more thing Pugin and I both love. Get me near the water. I am as happy as can be on my boat. Yeah. I even, yeah. I even did backdrop paintings for high school plays when I was an art teacher. So, so there you go. You're like the Pugin of the 21st century. The Midwest well, I Pugin. Hope, <laughs> I hope not as extreme as he was. I'm eccentric-ish, no. but not like yeah. that. Well, what I think is funny. So he, he did... Um, he he did wreck his boat off the coast of Scotland, and then he met um, a man called James Gillespie Graham, who was a very re- world, world renowned, I guess, British famous um, architect. And so they met, and he's uh, James Gillespie, or James Gillespie Graham, kind of persuaded Pugin to um, kind of set aside his his dreams of being a sailor. And maybe he should stick to drawing and, and perhaps look into architecture, which is what he did. And, and we're glad that he did that. However, um, he Pugin wrote some great books. <laughs> he did. And he but he also for a long time, he liked dressing like a sailor, you know, as you it's do. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just think I just love that about him. Like he just he was himself. He was absolutely yeah. himself. And he was probably a riot to be around. You know, mm-hmm. and um, so let's see. So what what did you, I'm, I'm sure you've got some sketches that we can talk about because I'd love to show people. Well, I want to jump into his sketches from his books. Yeah. So he did his contrast because he was very opinionated. He was. Rightly okay. so. He saw enough all his life to have a very strong opinion. He did. What and what he liked. Well, while you're bringing up the sketches, oh yeah, the contrasts. Um, I love the name of this book. It is. um, I'm so happy I found this website where you're actually paging through a very early edition of the book. Oh, nice. You'll have to put that in the the show notes. 
Oh, yes. We're going to send some people down some serious rabbit holes on this one. Totally. If you lo- And you know what? The thing is, everybody knows out of this for people to see this. Yeah. Oh, it's so yeah. beautiful. And the name of it is um, Contrasts or A Parallel Between the Noble Edifices of the 14th and 15th Centuries and Similar Buildings of the Present Day. And yeah. I think this is a modified one because... Um, I think he, I think he ended it with like you know, he he wanted to um, point out the decline in the quality yes. of buildings, and I should say this about Georgian buildings. So he was he was an adult, a well established adult and and um, architect um, during Queen Victoria's reign, but mm-hmm. he really came to age under the Georgian reign or the uh, reign of George the third. So he was Georgian and the Georgians were an incredibly decadent people. They really, really were. And this documentary that we're going to recommend to people, we would say, watch it with discretion. So I think if you have children, you should um, maybe look at it, watch it yourself and then decide whether or not you want your children to watch it. And that's not because of Pugin. That's because of the Georgians. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so he hated Georgian architecture. He related the architecture to the morality of the society. And I think this is what's so fascinating about him. Um, so the Georgian um, architecture and design, I mean, we look at it, it's beautiful. In fact, I don't know if you remember, Catherine, um, when we were in Shrewsbury, like right after the the Catholic cathedral, just mm-hmm. going, like when you go over, there's like this, Catherine and I were walking along a medieval wall and she was mm-hmm. really delighted to know that we were walking along the ramparts, although anybody could come over that wall, it's so low down now. But, <laughs> um, but there's like a little half circle of Georgian townhouses. And of course, we look at them and we go, oh my gosh, they're beautiful. Well, he hated those because it was the the buildings. So for example, there would be a facade of a pillar. The pillar wasn't really there holding anything up. It was just fake. And there was stucco um, covering up, you know, badly produced brick. And he felt like yeah, that Yeah, trying was, to make the bricks look like stone kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And and so he saw that that facade and that um, the bad quality of the building as a reflection of the morality of the culture that he was living in. And he, he hated it. Was it like it. that in the manor home we went to? Yes. Yes, it was. I remember the tour guy talking about the false facades and... I know. The Atcham. room trying to look more elaborate than it was. Yeah, it was Atcham Place. Yeah, yeah. Like it would, you know, they would have all of these, these different little tricks that they, tricks of the eye to make you think you were um, in a bigger space than you were or that it was grander than it really was. It was really, you know, and I think it's interesting. I actually don't have a problem with his argument. <laughs> because, <I know. laughs> You know, and it makes you think about walking around and looking at the the things that are going up now, you know, wherever you are. And, you know, how is is it a legitimate thing to relate or to connect the morality of a culture with its architecture? Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Imagine Pugin's contrast today. (laughs) Yeah. Like the brutalist movement. And, you know, and I always... I always think about, you know, where we live, we kind of live out in the country and we love to go walking and we kind of go way out um, and up into the hills. And then, but where we live, there's like this big power plant and it's so ugly and it doesn't matter how far up you go into the woods, you can't get away from it or up mm-hmm. into the hills and, and everything else about this area. I mean, it's known for being beautiful. And then you've got that. And it's, yeah. it's inescapable. It's just inescapable. And, and I just, I kind of, I don't have any counter argument to um, Pugin's position on. Here, this um, is one of Pugin's comparisons. Yeah. Between um, a town 
now for him, which was yeah, a Georgian town you know, or city. 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says the same town and he does his writing a Catholic town in yeah. 1440 and makes it all super elaborate. His writing and everything even looks crisper. Exactly. And it kind of, it made me laugh because you have this water stain running through where there's factories and broken down ruins yeah. and right dead center of it all is a prison. <laughs> yeah. And you look at what it used to look like, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, if he people was a have little... a chance, get a close look at this because you got to look real carefully. He numbered all the different buildings. It's kind of hard to find the numbers sometimes, but yeah, yeah, it's a fun amazing. thing to look at. But, and I think he also, um, I mean, and to be fair, to be fair, he really was trying to prove his, his point. So it was, he was very biased in the way he presented these things. But again, I'm sorry, you said like... prove his point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his pointed architecture. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And he, um, and so, I mean, he did not show uh, the, the things he opposed in any kind of good light. You know, so no. he was, he, you know, whatever. He just, he was trying to prove, he wanted to make his point known. He was very, um, he was so audacious about what he said. And remember, this is a Catholic in the early 1800s, kind of dissing everything that happened right, got, after, after the Reformation openly. I got one more real strong dissing openly. And okay. I've heard people say they recommend buying his book just because for the enjoyment and the humor of it in a way. Yeah, yeah. But here's another one of his comparisons. Yeah. And you've got, um, I should get us out of the way there. Yeah. Um. Let's fix this. Okay. So there we go. So you have the treatment of the poor. I love this. And I was yeah. so happy I found the website that I could get really good details on this. So here he is in the top. You've got um, a poor house, residence for the poor. It yeah. looks like the prison in the pre it does, previous yeah. picture, doesn't it? Well, because and then it, yeah. below you've got residence for the poor. And it looks like we're by a beautiful church with a cloister and a garden. Yeah. And all these wonderful things. And then when I zoomed in to see these two panels that contrast each other. And the top one for the modern day residence for the poor, you see these men stacking up coffins. And on the outside of the coffin, for dissection, and there's yeah. a body under a cloth, and it says, a variety of subjects always ready for medical students. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, what? Yeah, well, then, yeah. Yeah. And then to contrast it, you have, you know, the brothers of the poor, or, or the, the, the poor, poor brothers' man, convoy. The poor brothers' convoy, yeah. Yeah, and you see a beautiful Catholic burial service doesn't matter if the person's rich or poor. They're being buried, properly cared for, prayed for. Yeah. But oh my goodness, just to like yeah. throw it in someone's face like that was amazing. He absolutely did. And he was, and again, I think today we can't really appreciate the audacity of what he was doing. And, um, and he was like one of these super enthusiastic new converts. But he was like that his whole life. Like he never let up. <laughs> and I think they said he was a little too bold at times. And, sometimes, uh, sometimes. But that boldness yeah. was driven by this this genuine belief that um, that he was going to see the conversion of Britain. You know, mm -hmm. he really believed that, and that's why he put so much energy into it. And I do think, and this is again the influence of his mother. I think. Oh, actually, let's say both of his parents. He had a real concern for the poor and the way they were treated. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so his, uh, he, it, uh, that, again, that was a motivation and that was, that was a driving point. And, and quite frankly, at this point, you know, with the industrial revolution and you have a lot of the poor coming from the rural areas, moving into the cities, it was a real, it was really, really horrible 
you know, the slums, um, you know, Dickens wrote about these things and, um, and even mm-hmm. with the Georgians, you know, you have some of the illustrations of, uh, uh, from illustrators like Hogarth and, and they would just show the depravity and, and the real, um, the real tragedy and harshness of life for people. Mm-hmm. And he saw that and he, he imagined, he imagined uh, probably a Gothic or Catholic England that probably didn't exist as idealistic as he presented it. But at the same time, yes, the poor were treated very differently. Um, I think at one point there was a law passed that was illegal to be poor in England, in Britain. Okay. <laughs> I know. It's like, wow. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so so. You, you can't be poor and it's hard to be Catholic. And so Pugin yeah. had to actually like go through other people to get his designs out there. He did. He did. And there are a couple of con- uh, controversial things. Um, and this is something that has been remedied. I have to say it has been remedied mm-hmm. in this country, but um, he, one of the people that he worked with, was um I'm trying to find his name here. Um his last name is Barry, but I want to get his first name as well. Charles Barry. Sir, Sir Barry Charles is, Barry. Yeah. And he was um he was an architect and Pugin had worked with him and for him for a number of years. And Parliament burned down and they needed to um so, so sorry, the House of Lords and the House of Parliament burned down. They needed to have another one built. By the way, mm-hmm. everybody was really happy that it had burned down because they felt like the corruption in that building was could never be remedied except through fire, I guess. So it was it was <laughs> a little purging. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually because they were just so it really was. It, it's a very interesting times he lived in. You know, lots of people were cynical about the government and politics and um, there were all kinds of issues going on. And uh, yeah, so that's also interesting to know he lived in that time. Not an easy yeah. time to be Catholic, not an easy time to, um, to kind of, if, if you, you know, seeing some of the problems and the corruption in, in the government and in the society, that's where he was, where he was creating mm-hmm. all this beautiful stuff. But um, so he was very, um, I guess, put in a bid to design um, the House of Parliament. And he, he, was able to draw some of it, but a majority of the sketches for this new House of Parliament were done by Pugin. Mm-hmm. And, and so he won the commission mm-hmm. and he did not give Pugin any credit for it at all. Mm-hmm. And so just we, added here for people to see the sketch yeah. on the left is Pugin's sketch for the interior. Is that his sketch or is that his dad's sketch? Is that his father's sketch? Uh, from what I saw, I believe that's his sketch. Okay, okay. No, because I know this that... is part of the bid, I thought. Okay, okay. No, because I'm looking at his his father did a book on um on no, that's right. So that's his, that's Pugin's sketch. But I will say this, I think it was done in a similar way. This is why I was thinking about it, it was his dad. His oh, okay. father did all of the architecture for this, um, for books on England, for books on the various cities, buildings mm-hmm. around England. And then a second illustrator would come in and draw the people. And, mm-hmm. and so I, and I just thought that was interesting. So he had grown up seeing how that could happen. And so this is... Um, well, so he that's would have learned saying. that from his dad, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. That's that's my point. Yeah, he would have learned yeah. that from his father. And um, yeah, so we've got when I think it's amazing how um, the House of Parliament, that's such an incredible thing. And it was like done in someone's lifetime. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's because it was done with, you know, Victorian engineering and technology, which which Pugin was not opposed to using. You know, he yeah. he, he wasn't like the arts and crafts movement where they wanted to do everything like, Oh, I'm just going to like grind this stone with some water and a prayer. I'm going <laughs> <laughs> to 
that's you it. Know. <laughs> yeah. So he he was like, if we can use the mechanics of today to to get things done, then let's do it. And yeah, so yeah. he wasn't he wasn't in that way afraid of progress at all. He he mm-hmm. wanted to use it. But um but anyway, so he designed essentially he designed Parliament. He but Barry he he got his peerage through this design by Pugin and he um also got the commission or he got the job to design the tower um and the clock of Big Ben. Mm-hmm. And he tried and tried and tried. He just couldn't do it. And at this point, Pugin was actually literally on his deathbed and Barry came to him and was like, I need your help. And so Pugin helped him and he worked as he said, he'd worked harder on that project than any other project he'd ever done in his life. Mm -hmm. And Barry took all the credit for it. And I guess Pugin was so proficient in his sketching that he could create things very quickly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's because he he was drawing every day of his life. I mean, I, and I think yeah. this is something that I've really been taking to heart lately. And it makes so much sense. You know, when mm-hmm. you draw, it doesn't just happen. It's like anything else. You know, there are very few people who can pick up um, a baseball bat and swing it and and yeah. do whatever it is, whatever like a great thing is that you do when you <laughs> hit the yeah. ball out of the park. Is that the expression? <laughs> Yeah. There are very few people who can do that. Um, mm-hmm. And if people can naturally do that, if they practice, they can do even more. And that, so there was a natural ability there, but it was also um, that natural ability was accompanied with a lot of self-discipline. Um, well, let's share and, some of his sketches. That yeah. We found. Yeah. So these are sketches that were for wallpaper. Yeah. For the house of parliament. And you can see, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, for me as an artist, to see his sketching and how he sketches was very reassuring for me because so many times you see the finished result, like on the right-hand side here is an actual snippet of the wallpaper. Yeah. And you see the finish and everybody thinks, oh my gosh, it's amazing. What you don't always see is how it begins. The rendering. To see all of his other little lines that are in there. And it's like, okay, I'm doing okay. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And and I'm just And the strawberries, I don't know if the strawberries actually made it into one of the wallpapers. I don't know. But I just love strawberries, so I put it in there. (laughs) Well, and also I was going to say with that strawberry, you can look at how he's influenced William Morris with his famous design of the strawberry thief. And if you mm-hmm. haven't seen, again, I think if you, if a lot of people have seen the strawberry thief, so I would say, just take a look at it, you know, look at that, or sorry, look at William Morris's strawberry thief, and then take a look at this Pugin um, rendering of a strawberry. And, and you'll definitely see that influence there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And he did a lot of, um, he also, I should say this, even though he was very much um, a believer and a supporter of, uh, you know, whatever was happening technologically at the, at the time and to use that, mm-hmm. he also um, really utilized people who had, had kept um, some of the old ways of doing things or he mm-hmm. encouraged people. He, there was this environment created around him where people could rediscover how tiles were made in medieval times. So there's Minton or Miton tiles. And I live in an area that's famous for tiles. And um, and so Mm -hmm. Miton was a contemporary of Pugin. And he he rediscovered a technique called, I think it's called ectostic. Acoustic, 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 yep. Tile making, and that because that had kind of been that fell to the wayside, and so they kind of brought back the technology and the techniques used for that. And mm-hmm. I have a couple of things. I know you've got um, some more pictures of tiles, but I want to show. Oh, but before we do that, I got some more inside okay. uh, stuff from Parliament. So oh, just jump, 
jump back indoors here. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the sovereign's throne. Yeah. On the left. Absolutely gorgeous. It is. And can I just say, if people want to look back on um, our episode with about um, the two Van Eyck brothers Mm -hmm. and the, um, oh my gosh, the alt Gent, uh, the Ghent altar piece and the, the thrones. I, I just wonder if Pugin hadn't had access to that, because if you look at that <laughs> and mm-hmm. you look at the Van Eyck painting, makes you wonder. Oh yeah. It does feel very familiar. Yeah. And then just our simple little dining room chair. Simple. Oh. Yeah. Which you designed at 15. Detail. This one? I think so. Yeah. I think no, this one was, this one was for. This is for the for, parla- for parliament. Okay. Yeah. This is okay. yeah for the, um, the house. Um, it's lovely, isn't it? The speaker's house, I think it was, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I mean, the little lion head detail on the, on the chair and all the way down to the carvings way down all the way to the feet. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 All of it. All of it is gorgeous. I'd take a dining room like that. Why not? <laughs> I know. I know. I have to tell you something funny that I found out today. So, you know, I'm just going to try to as quietly as possible, pick this up. So okay. everyone can oh, look at this. Is. So years ago, how do I, years ago, I went into an antique shop and I bought this for like four pounds. And, um, and I show you the other one that I bought for four pounds. And um, and this is acoustic tiling, and it is old. And um, I thought, oh, I'll just get two because I'm cheap. And then I went back the next day because my husband was like, oh, maybe we should get some more. And the guy was like, I got into a lot of trouble because um, those I should not have sold those to you. Those are Pugin tiles. <laughs> <laughs> and he like kind of put on a little sad dog face, like I was going to bring him back. I'm like, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> Find my, your skippers. <laughs> I know, I'm taking my fusion tiles. And so, um, and then this is one that is a copy. And I got this one, Catherine, when, mm-hmm. when you were over yes. visiting. And, um, but what's so funny is today when I was working, a lady came into the bookshop and uh, she, we started talking about Pugin and she loves him, of course. And she goes, I have two Pugin um, bookends that he designed when they were, uh, they were made for the, the world or the, the great exhibition that Victoria yes. and Albert had. And she goes, but you know what? I'm pretty sure they're fake. She goes, everybody thinks they have something that was designed by Pugin in their house. <laughs> It's like, I mean, you look I at his sketches <laughs> and I tell you though, I, I did look through a lot of sketches on the Victoria Albert Museum website and yeah. I did see a lot of sketches for tiles that looked very similar to what you held up. You think? And I did take a, I did, I took a picture of actually one when you and I went to the museum near your house. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That so here's in the case, the picture that I took on the left. Yeah. And then here was the credit for the design that Puget did. And okay. It's like, yes, this is for sure his design. I mean, That's obviously true. you make hundreds of tiles to com- cover Thousands. the floor. Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just neat to see that's like, oh yeah, it, it could be. It really I guess. Could be. Yeah. I don't know. But I was just, <laughs> I had to laugh because I thought, oh, okay, maybe. Who knows? But, yeah. but she goes, oh, everybody wants to. Everyone says they have something that Pugin designed in their house because that's how beloved he is now. And I do have to say, um, before we, we, we kind of wrap up, um, his, his sons were really outraged by what Charles Berry had done. Mm-hmm. And they presented um, a case for their father. But it wasn't until really the 20th century that they formally were like, yeah, he's the one who actually... Um, Mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think it did bury any good in terms of, of, um, where he is now. It's interesting. You know, he was Mm -hmm. this great architect in the 19th century. And now he has this, this reputation of being someone who was a usurper, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, 
you know, so, so, so we just would love to, for people to get to know Pugin better. I think he would have been, like I said, a riot to be around. He probably was completely exhausting. He was probably one of those people, like when he finally went home, you're like, oh my gosh, that was fun, (laughs) but let's not invite him back for another week or two. (laughs) I need to recover. But, um, but anyway, uh, but before we before we um, sign off and maybe have a couple of reflections, um, I yeah. want to take a well, let's moment. Let's take a go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say let's take a moment in a moment, to yes. thank our patrons, and um, we'd like to thank all of our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of sacred art, including Anthony C, Liz D, Michael B, Hannah, and Fritha T. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of sacred art and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And um, yeah, so let's just take a few, the, the last few moments here and, and talk about his legacy Oh, let's do a little Pugin slideshow. That's what I was going to say. Let's just yeah. do a, just give people a taste. So uh, these are a couple of things I just saw and fell in love with and said, yeah, people need to see this. Yeah. And it looks ancient, doesn't it? And it does. It looks like it's been there forever. Yeah. But it's... Um, so, uh, this is... Is this... I, mean, I, want to, I want to say it right, Alex. You say it for me. Do you know, I have no idea how to say this one. I would say Scarsbrick, Scarsbrick okay, Hall. Scarsbrick Hall? Yeah. yeah. No doubt somebody will be in. Uh, and I mean, just, you know, me. yeah. All that beautiful pointed architecture yeah. style. And it's, it's fabulous. And then next. Branwell Castle. Yeah, this looks like it has... Um, it looks like it has flint on the outside, which is so cool. And you do see that sometimes in churches and houses um, in certain parts of England. And it's so neat looking. A lot of you work. You know what's really fun about it? What? It's a bed and breakfast. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, people live there, but they do open the home for guests. So you can find, I'll put a link to their, their website in case anybody wants to say they stayed in a Pugin design. Yeah, How and you know what? Is that <laughs> actually his his house, um, uh, the Grange? You can stay there oh. as well, and oh. so I've provided a a link for that as well. So nice. this is called. Oh, this is so beautiful. In fact, can you yeah. can you get us off? Yeah, of the, <laughs> so let's get us can, out of the way so we yay. can see the beauty. So this is Saint Giles Catholic Church in Cheadle, and um, and I and it's called Pugin's Gem. And it is just exquisite. And uh, yeah, just take your, you know, take in everything. And of course, he didn't do the painting. You know, they had he worked with with artists who who um, who rendered all of the the images in here. And he just set out the framework, and it's just gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Just yeah, gorgeous. He gave them all the details. They just had to fill it in. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And what and do we have next? Oh, that's the tile. We saw that. Yeah. But here we go. The Grange at Ramsgate. So that's down yeah. that's down south. Um mm-hmm. and uh yeah, you can stay you can stay there, believe it or not. I think it's like oh. an Airbnb. I don't think it's a bed and breakfast. I think it's an Airbnb, which is so amazing. I and, did see a um, lot of tour photos people had posted of going there. Yeah. I, yeah. So um and I did provide a, a link. There'll be a link at the in the show notes, uh, so you can take a look at that and possibly stay in his house. I just want to live there. Quite honestly, oh that gosh. lower bay window is his office. Yeah, I want a big bay window in my studio. That'd be great light. I know. <laughs> although I'm going to have to say, even though I do love our dear Mr. Pugin, that wallpaper. I'm just not a big fan of his wallpaper, but that's the okay. wallpaper is, is a lot to take in. I don't think my husband would go for that either. But no, and so that's another here's a angle. Great, yeah, another yeah. angle where you can see the church next. Yes, door. that he he funded himself, and this is the mm-hmm. thing. And and um, I know we're coming towards the end here, but um, a lot of the churches he designed 
and built. So he built this one and it never was finished. It doesn't have a steeple. This is St. Augustus. And he believed that he was named after St. Augustine. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, he spent his own money building this church. But he also, he never saw the wealth and the, he was not a good self-promoter and he never um, had the wealth that he really, that Barry had um, from basically stealing Pugin's designs and, and taking the credit for Pugin's work um, because he wasn't a good self-promoter, as I said, but he also did things um, at a very low cost. Uh, and sometimes he didn't charge anything for designing churches because mm-hmm. again, he felt like he felt like this was something that he needed to do. Uh, he wanted to give England um, a Catholic story again. And and he was willing to, so the cost was not, um, the money wasn't important to him. Yeah. I put more of his sketches here. Yeah. Um, I believe the one on the left was actually used in his um, shrine to St. Augustine that he built. Mm. But just to see the, how, how he sketches out details for everything. Yeah. On the right you have lighting and reliquaries and tiles it's all it all fits together it's not just a ramble throw together of decoration it all goes together it all makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah and then take it another step farther alex and i both love the needle arts yes this is the hood of a cope so this would go basically shoulder to shoulder yeah um Across the back of the priest. And that's St. Augustine. Yeah. In the and you really, there. yeah. And again, you can really see how he influenced the um, arts and crafts movement in, mm-hmm. in Britain. You really can see that. Um, yeah. And also, I should say this. He did have, oh, and here's, here's Pugin, uh, his tomb. And mm-hmm. um, I think one of his sons designed the uh, coffin or the sarcophagus. And that would be his three wives, because ultimately he had, um, sorry, no, I think those are his children. And then he, he did marry three twi- times and he survived, uh, he was survived by his third wife. So he lost his second wife. Um, he had mm-hmm. six or seven children. And I'm going to provide, or we'll provide a link in the show notes to the Pugin Society. And if you want to kind of look at his family and go into a little more, Um, detail about his life. Uh, That's Mm -hmm. a great resource. Again, Rosemary Hill's book is, is just really, really good. And I think one of the last things I want to point out, which I didn't know, I mean, I learned this when we were were going into this, um, the influence that he had uh, in Australia. So there are some churches that he Mm -hmm. designed that have been built in Australia and one was not finished in France. Mm -hmm. Uh, He has a number of, uh, churches that he designed in Ireland and he modified those to be consistent with Irish Gothic art. And again, when you think about, I mean, I think in some ways we can't really appreciate how um, the kind of man he was. I want to say a real charitable man because he, he altered the, um, the Gothic design to be more consistent with Irish Gothic tradition. Mm -hmm. And when you think about the relationship of the British empire with Ireland, and then for this man to then go to Ireland and do something like that, that was an incredibly humble and charitable act. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's extraordinary. And, um, but he also, really influenced um, architecture in the United States. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, yes, I, I just think And I'd say, so like, his, his, in, his influence is interesting in the United States because I feel like some architects will follow what Pugin was thinking, you know, to see the, the beauty and depth of the Gothic style Mm-hmm. And how it really was very focused in what it was doing. And then others, I think, have an idea of what they think Pugin was about. 
Yeah. And so they're influenced that way off of, so it's always interesting to see how, how people are influenced by him and it how they want to be influenced by or him. Or say they're influenced because they want to like have some legitimacy. And I think, you know, this is like kind of a, like a spontaneous idea I have here. I wonder, I would love for people um, on our Discord channel to, um, we should t- discuss this. Like I would encourage people to obviously listen and watch our podcast, but also go to some of the documentaries and the links that we're going to provide because I think this is a great subject. You know, we're, we're running out of time, you know, we, yeah. <laughs> we, with this, with this podcast, but this is a conversation that, um, that we would love to continue. And uh, so I we'll definitely ha- recommend looking at just the list on Wikipedia of all of his works. Oh, it I is know. shocking yeah. how much this man accomplished. And if you, if you start from when he was 15, Really yeah. being out there in the world till the time he died at only the age of 40. Yeah. Yeah. That list is incredible. Of I know. Where he worked, what he did. I mean, sadly, there's so many of them that say they're taken down now or no longer yeah. in use or yeah. been redone so they don't look Pugin anymore. But what an incredible amount of energy and give yeah. that he and had in his designs. Yeah. Yeah. And I would, I'm also curious. I just wonder how much he, you know, when you look at his stuff and you look at the pre-Raphaelites and the arts and crafts movement, and uh, I just wonder if he in any way influenced Tolkien. I don't know if if we'll ever know, but Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all very Tolkien-esque, this world that he was envisioning. um, And I've even heard in one of our, uh, the documentaries or an interview that, that we watched, um, they even likened Harry Potter to being um, everybody wants to, everyone wants to spend time in a Pugin bi- building because yeah. <laughs> they're so beautiful. Uh, and here he is. This was painted by his dear friend um, who I think eventually converted to Catholicism as well. But this was his a portrait that he did of Pugin and um, the little coat of arms above is the Pugin coat of arms that May or may not have been restored by um, the King of France uh, through his uncle, who was a court painter. Uh, What's which, fascinating is Pugin designed the frame for this. Now that I didn't know. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what's Man neat was... is in his coat of arms, the little bird. Yeah. It doesn't have feet. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's about... <laughs> because yeah. it never lands. Yes. How fitting for Pugin himself. That exactly. little bird did not stop his entire life. And do you know what? If you look at his outfit, I don't know what that one is. He looks a little bit like a, a Don, uh, prof- mm-hmm. very professorial there. But it's black and it looks kind of like he could have wings, like he is the bird. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But so anyway. much to know about this man. I know, I know. And so let's, mm-hmm. I'm ju- we're just going to encourage you to uh, join us in a, a discussion. We would absolutely yeah. love it. We love this man and we want you to love him as much as we do. And, and we want him to be known uh, better, uh, not just by his buildings, you know, you're kind of surrounded by him, but you really should know the man himself. He, he's That's really why special. those books are fabulous. We could actually read his words. Yes. So get out there. There's there's a book on Amazon that's his. And, yeah. you know, some of them are in reprint right now. But if enough people get out there, I think we'll get more reprints. Yeah. And not only that, yeah. but he was actually very, apparently he was a very funny man as well. Mm-hmm. So I, one of his, my favorite quotes from his, his was, um, one of his books was, everything fabulous is, no, everything glorious is Catholic. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got to add that one somewhere. <laughs> I know. I should get a right. T-shirt like that. <laughs> oh, with Pugin's like crest on it. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be very all right, cool. Well, we would like to thank all our listeners for joining us on Secrets of Sacred Art. To find previous episodes of the Secrets of Sacred Art and to send feedback, visit us at sqpn.com slash sacred art. You can email us at sacredart at sqpn.com or follow on StarQuest on social media at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media and 
Twitter X, I never know what to say on that one, at (laughs) SQPN, or please join our Discord community at sqpn.com slash Discord. We would love to see, maybe you have a piece of art in your home that's Pugin-esque to you. Yeah, or it could even be something that was really designed by Pugin. You, you never, never know. know. <laughs> never know. Go through the sketches. You'll see them. Yeah. So we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing um, how architecture and its symbolism fits in with the liturgy. So That's until then, I'm Catherine Laffrey. And I'm Alex Murray. And we hope you find something beautiful. Bye-bye.